Okay, so uh, last time we finished up chapter one, we're going to get started now on chapter two. Um, so uh, multivariable functions, what we're going to start off with, uh, you all probably know what functions are, generally speaking. Um, I want to solidify one little thing before we go on and talk about multivariable functions, and that is, in fact, what is a function? A lot of people would tell you that a function is just a formula. It's not really quite correct. Um, a function is three things. There's the formula, but then there's the set that the inputs come from. That's called the domain. And then there is the set that the outputs land in. That's called the target. So um, again, uh, in order to have a function, we talk about all three of those things. Um, so now, very often, what the domain is, what the target is, is either kind of nah, not really particularly directly computationally relevant to what we're actually doing, in which case people kind of ignore it and leave it off. Um, um, or it's obvious, perhaps. Um, and in those cases, sure, we're a little sloppy sometimes and uh, maybe don't write that down. But in a lot of cases, really not obvious and it really needs to be said. Um, so um, anyway, here's an example. A lot of people would tell you that's a function. And again, you know, a little bit sloppily, sure, I suppose that's fine. But uh, it's really more completely a function if you indicate these three things. Now this notation down here is just a way of saying that let me tell you something about this function f. That's the domain, that's the target. Right? And the idea of the arrow is it's sort of indicating what the function does. The function takes stuff that's in here in the domain and it sends it in some way or another into the target. Okay, so it's very standard notation. I'm going to be using it a lot throughout the book, so uh, be aware. Um, so now let me point out another thing. Given a formula, uh, that does not impose upon you what the domain and target have to be necessarily. Right? So for, for example, here it is true that I could put any real number into that formula. Yeah, absolutely. It doesn't mean I have to. Right? Um, it is true that everything that comes out of this formula will be a real number. It doesn't mean that I have to um, uh, necessarily continue to allow that possibility if I don't need to. Uh, now, with all possible real numbers going in, then yeah, these outputs uh, could really be any, all, any, any real numbers, and so I do need to leave the target like that. But if I change the domain and the target like this, so note we've got the same formula here. A lot of people would call that the same function. This is not the same function because while it is the same formula, you'll note it has a different domain and a different target. For the purposes of this function, different function, computed by the same formula to be fair, I am saying that the domain is just the real numbers between 0 and 1 inclusive. So that's my function. Um, I am only going to be interested in the values of this function between 0 and 1. Now, given that, given that only real numbers between 0 and 1 are going in to this function, what's going to come out? Well, these outputs, uh, 75 is not coming out. Right? Uh, only certain numbers can come out. In fact, you can persuade yourself that every number that comes out will be somewhere between 0 and 10. So this is uh, a, a different and perfectly acceptable function. Now, you might notice uh, that interval from 0 to 10 is bigger than it needs to be. Perfectly fine. No problem. There's no law that says that the target has to be you know, as small as possible given the function and get, or given the uh, formula and given the domain. It just has to be that what comes out always has to land in that target. And that's it. You don't have to fill the target. Um, the uh, distinction Namely, what actually comes out, these actual output values are called the image. Again, the image might be smaller than the target. In this case, you can persuade yourself that the image, given this function, given the domain, uh, the image is the interval from 5 to 8. Right? In fact, 
These are the actual numbers that come out of that formula, given the domain x uh, uh, ranges between 0 and 1. Uh, so the image from 5 to 8 is not the same as the target that I've arbitrarily set up as from 0 to 10. Okay, so that's just an example. I just wanted to make sure that we're on board with what a function is and the basic terminology and, uh, and notation uh, to describe uh, these, these kinds of functions. So I want to move on now and talk about multivariable functions. Here's an example of a formula that's part of a multivariable function. And it's multivariable in a couple of different ways. Uh, most importantly, really, note that there are multiple variables that go into this function. It's not just a single number that goes in. It's three separate numbers that go into this function. You can't compute this unless you know x, y, and z. Okay. All right. Um, likewise, notice that multiple numbers come out. In this case, there are two outputs. So this is not a what we call a real valued function. A real valued function is a function where the values are just real numbers. Here the values are pairs of real numbers. Okay. So this is multivariable in a couple of different ways. Now a different point of view on this is let's look at these inputs. You know, this input that consists of these three real numbers. Uh, a different way of thinking about that is I could think about those three real numbers as being the coordinates uh, of a point in three-dimensional space. So is it that there are three numbers going in, or is it that there is a point whose coordinates are x, y, and z that is going into this function? So is it plural, is it singular? It depends on your point of view. And it's kind of nice, actually, to think of this as a point that goes in. Um, because then, note, look how you can uh, write your domain. You can write as your domain R3, right? Points that have three coordinates, those points are in the set R3. So it's kind of a convenient uh, point of view, if nothing else, for the notational purposes. Uh, likewise, you could view this as two numbers, or you could view it as a point in R2. So very routinely, when we write down a function whose formula is this, something along these lines, we'll say that it's a function from, uh, in this case, these specifics, uh, R3 to R2. Okay, so that's what a multivariable function looks like. I'm going to show you a couple of examples just so you'll see how commonplace this really is. Um, starting with um, this, this is what I like to call the uh, temperature function. And we're sitting inside of an example of this right now. Namely, this is a way of describing temperature in a room. So let's suppose I set that corner as the origin. And there's the x-axis, and there's the y-axis, and there's the z-axis. Right? <coughs> Every point in this room can be described by coordinates. Right? So this point right there has an x-coordinate, and a y-coordinate, and a z-coordinate that describes this point. At this point, I can ask the question, what's the temperature? Right? And I'll get some number. So the point uh, is in this domain D, which is a subset of R3, right? looking at the points in this room. Um, the output value of the function evaluated at that point is a real number representing the temperature at that point. As a perfectly physical and relatable situation that we could very naturally want to talk about, I just want to be able to talk about the temperature in the room. What it is is a multivariable function. Is everybody on board? Everybody see the idea there? Okay. Um, next one is called the altitude function. I like to call it the altitude function. So, uh, point is, if you look at the uh, land surface in the United States, you can view that as being, uh, in some sense, kind of like a subset of the UV plane. And the, the idea is I'm going to have U representing uh, latitude and V representing longitude or vice versa. It doesn't really matter. But the point is you can think of the map right, as being coordinates in a plane. Uh, that being said, at a particular set of coordinates, I'm going to define the function to be altitude above sea level at that point on the map. Right, so now where we are right now, if you were to let's go to the ground level, it's like um, I think it's about 300 feet above sea level. So at the 
coordinates, whatever the coordinates of this location uh, are, uh, H of those coordinates is 300. So it's a multivariable function because there are two numbers that go in, right, U and V, uh, uh, some point in the United States, right, that's the input, and then what comes out is altitude above sea level. Is everybody on board? Okay. So just a couple of examples. One more example. Um, I'm going to do this one down here. It's a little bit more physically relatable. Um, this is, uh, I'm going to loosely call this the weather function. So it's got uh, two inputs and four outputs. Just uh, the purpose of this example is just to show you that uh, there's all kinds of multivariable functions that are all physically very natural. So two inputs, four outputs. The inputs are longitude and latitude, so describing a point somewhere on the map. And the outputs are um, various aspects um, of that just go into describing what the weather is at that point on the map. So in particular, at a particular point on a map, um, there's a temperature, uh, there's a barometric pressure. Um, there's a certain amount of humidity, you know, how much uh, water vapor is in the air. Um, and there's a uh, wind speed, you know, how fast is the wind blowing. So all of these are pretty physically relatable. It's a pretty simple concept, really. But note it is a highly multivariable function with a grand total of six variables to keep track of, two inputs and four outputs. All right. Is everybody happy? All right. So. <clears throat> Let's talk about how to draw pictures of these things. How would I draw a picture, for example, of this function? <laughs> it's tough. So let, let me start by going back to single variable functions and talking about pictures we draw of single variable functions. This is a picture, a certain kind of a picture of a single variable function, and specifically this is called a graph. So hopefully you all have heard that term before. Uh, this is the graph of a particular function. And the idea, we'll talk about graphs more a little bit later today after we've done some other stuff, hopefully time permitting. Um, at a particular value x, you take that value of x, you plug into the function, you get some output value. That output value you call y, and that's how far you move in the direction of the y-axis to get then a, uh, a point on the curve. And if you do this for every input point, um, for every input value of x, you get a height, and that gives you this curve. So I hope that's familiar. Okay. So what's great about graphs is a couple of things that are great about graphs. For one thing, in some sense, there's a spot on the page corresponding to every input value for the function, at least all the ones that you care to draw. Maybe this continues on over on the left and the right. I didn't feel like drawing, but I could have. Right. Um, so in some sense, you feel like you can see the whole function, and that's very satisfying. Um, there's some other really nice things that I have indicated here. The picture here gives you a connection between algebraic facts and geometric intuition. This is <coughs> extremely valuable. So for example, let's look at what we see at this point right here. Um, now, the function in question. Algebraically speaking, if I were to talk about the derivative of that function, which is a, keep in mind, the derivative is defined in terms of limits and certain fraction, et cetera. That's a very algebraically defined thing. And if the derivative is less than zero, this is all algebra here, then geometrically, that manifests itself in a certain way on the picture. In this case, since we're looking at a graph, the way negative derivatives show up on a graph is that the slope of the tangent line is negative. So the graph specifically gives us a geometric cue for an algebraic fact. Okay. Similarly, let's look at this point here. Suppose the second derivative of the function is positive, as is sort of indicated here. Well, the, the, this algebraic fact is represented geometrically by the fact that the curve is concave up. Right. Now, why concave up? 
Well, it's because the graph construction is put together in a very special, particular way, and that's just coincidentally what it happens to look like on the graph when the second derivative is positive. And likewise, slope is negative because the derivative is negative. That's just kind of how the graph construction works. So said differently, these geometric interpretations of these algebraic statements are peculiar to the graph construction. They are part of the graph construction. And the reason I like to make a big deal out of that is that I feel it necessary to point out, and we'll be seeing a lot of this in the uh, future, graphs are not the only pictures we're going to be looking at in this course. In fact, we are usually not going to be looking at graphs. Uh, certainly very, very often we will not be looking at graphs. Right? So these ideas that, oh, if the derivative is negative, that means the slope of the tangent like what well, probably not. Be prepared for it. most situations we'll be looking at in the course. Statements about the derivative won't mean negative, negatively sloped tangent line. It's good. We're going to have a different kind of a picture that not a graph that we'll be looking at. Likewise, second derivative, you know, it's, just, it's not going to really look like this. Okay. So it's very important for students to realize this. Uh, the reason I don't like to make a big deal is that uh, most students, having taken single variable calculus classes, this is the only picture you've ever seen for functions, overwhelmingly often. And so students get it in their mind that this is what a function is and that the derivative is the slope of the tangent line. And the second derivative is the concavity. And it's not. Okay, it's those things if you are looking at a graph. So those are properties of graphs. We're going to be looking at other geometric constructions that will have different geometric manifestations of the various kinds of derivatives that we're going to talk about. So heads up on that. Okay. Um, so um, yeah, here's a different point of view, different way to represent a function. And let's, by the way, let's talk about uh, this kind of a function here, function from R3 to R2. How would I draw the graph? Again, we'll talk about that in more detail a little bit later. But uh, just very quickly, I mean, if you think about it, on the graph, if the input variable and the output variable are both supposed to be there, well, single variable, one input, one output, that's why we get a two-dimensional picture. If I have instead a function with three input variables and two output variables, I have a grand total of five variables. How am I going to draw that picture? I would need a five-dimensional piece of paper, which we don't have. Right? So really important to recognize that uh, I simply cannot even entertain the possibility of drawing the graph of a function that looks like this. And yet, I'd like to have a picture of some sort, just something I can kind of get my hands on, anything that's uh, natural and relates to this function in any reasonable way. We're desperate for some way to draw a picture that somehow relates to this function. So I'm going to show you a, uh, a simple one. And it's this picture right here. And the picture is draw the domain. There it is. Domain is R3. Three-dimensional points, right? The target, draw that separately over here, R2. And the function is just the process of taking a point in the domain and giving you as its output a point in the target. So it is kind of a picture, albeit a thin and unsatisfying one, right? It's kind of, sort of, in very sad sense of the word, a picture of what this function's doing. And um, it beats trying to draw a five-dimensional graph, which, of course, we can't do at all. Okay. Now, obviously, the limitation in this is that, look, I, as I have it here, I can only draw one input and one output at a time. Uh, I guess I could do multiple of them if I, like, color-coded, you know, like maybe this point goes to that point, uh, something like that. I could maybe draw whatever is the limitation on the number of colors that I can draw with and distinguish and keep track of in my mind. It's a pretty, pretty small number. Uh, so, nevertheless, I can only draw a very small number of points. So I can't see what the entire function is doing. I just I don't have enough space to do that. 
Um, so it's limited, but at least it's a picture. Now, what we're going to find later on, uh, probably next week at some point, uh, is that uh, this is actually a pretty good point of view uh, in certain ways. Uh, specifically, when we start talking about derivatives, and you might sort of entertain the question, what would it mean to have a derivative of a function like this? How would we even write, what should the derivative be? What, what, in some sense, what should the derivative, uh, what should the derivative be based on? Um, it's a good question to be kind of chewing on, and we'll, get, we'll fill in that blank next week. But uh, it's going to turn out that this picture is a wonderful context in which to talk about and make reasonable discussions of what a derivative of a function like this should look like. How, would, how we should write it down algebraically, and then we'll go ahead and actually do all that stuff. So um, this is our first sort of alternative to the graph construction, uh, and it's going to be useful. Okay. All right, so the several exercises for you all there. I'm going to move on now and talk about 2.2. Um, uh, this section is kind of a long one, sadly, uh, but there's a lot of good stuff in here. Uh, I'm not going to do all of the examples in this section because it's just not time. So I'm going to do important examples. And I'm going to leave several of the examples for you guys to read through on your own. So again, uh, you know, uh, nature of the beast in this course is just not enough time to do everything and so you're going to have to do some of the reading on your own and this will be one of those cases. Okay. So uh, we're going to talk about something called equations. Uh, again, I think you all have seen equations before and I want to start off by uh, pointing out that Equations and functions are not the same thing. So very often students kind of conflate the terms and oh, whatever, if it's a function, it's an equation, and if it's an equation, well, come on, there's a function, and, and just kind of sloppy about the terminology. You can kind of sort of get away with that in a single variable calculus class, and you absolutely cannot in a multivariable calculus class. So it's very important to see the distinction between an equation and a function. So we talked about functions. Functions are trios. Right? A function is a formula with a domain and a target. Said differently, a function is a process where you have a starting set and an ending set and the function is the, the, the process that takes things out of the first set and takes them over into the second set. So it's a it's a process in some sense. Right? That's not what an equation is. An equation is just anything that has an equal sign in it. Said differently, an equation is a statement. It's a statement that says this equals that. Uh, said differently, these two things have the same values. So that's not the same as a process. Right? It's fundamentally different critter. So make sure to, uh, to uh, see that distinction. Now they're related in certain ways. We use equations to describe how a function acts. Right? So that technically is an equation. It's an equation that we're using to describe a function. Okay. But not all equations are. Here, I'm just looking for a particular value of x. I'm looking for a value of x or more if there happen to be more, but I'm looking for a value of x for which the left side equals the right side. Side note, that's not what's happening here. I'm not looking for a particular value of x here. This is a statement about algebra. This is a statement that in all cases for all values of x, what's on the left could be rewritten equivalently as what I've written on the right, sort of different algebraic expressions that are always the same. We use equations for various different reasons. Okay. All right, so I have an equation. Next thing I want to talk about is what is the solution set to the equation. Um, first, let's talk about what a solution is. Um, notice this is an equation that involves two different variables. This equation involves x's and y's. So a solution to this equation is not a number. Right, a number is not enough information to plug in. If I want to plug into the equation and see if it works or not, uh, I need an x and a y. So a solution to the equation is a pair of numbers. Said differently, a solution to this equation is a point in R2. 
right? So it's different from a single variable equation in that sense. All right. The solution set is the collection of all solutions to that equation. All right. So um, some simple examples. Uh, let's look at this equation there. That's an equation. Note that it involves two variables, x and y. The set of solutions to that equation, it's not just, you know, give me an x and a y that works. Give me a point, in other words, that works. The solution set is all possible points that satisfy that equation. And it's not hard to persuade yourself. Flashback to middle school uh, algebra. Um, oh, did I not draw a picture of this? Hmm, I didn't draw a picture of that. Um, this is the set of solutions is this line there, this red line. Right? All right. There it is. Okay, uh, likewise, there's an equation. The solution set is a circle. All right, um, what about this equation? Now here's where things start to get different. Here's where we're going to have to kick in and start doing some multivariable analysis um, uh, because this is unfamiliar. Uh, here what we have is it's an equation. It's just an equation. Still looking for the solution set. Note the solution set is going to be in R3 because there's x, y, and z. So any solution involves three numbers, and therefore any solution is a point in R3. And um, up to this point, I assume you all probably haven't done any uh, equations of three variables. And so we don't know how to talk about, we just don't have any previous experience with what these things look like. What are the solution sets to these kinds of equations? So I'm going to show you some techniques for how to take uh, an equation of three variables and break it down, sort of reduce it to a lower dimensional problem that allows you to get your foot in the door. So the first one I'm going to tell you about is how to do cross sections. Okay. So in particular, what if I were to take this equation and instead of looking for the solutions to that equation, what if I were to look for the solutions to that equation which also satisfy this other equation? So I'm going to look now at this pair of equations. Well, two things happen. The first thing that happens is I realize that I can take this formula for y and I can plug it into there and I get z equals x squared plus c squared. So this turns into this. So algebraically, that's what happens. I get uh, uh, conveniently, by the way, an equation of two variables. And, and, it, we, and we know what this is, right? Again, Algebra 2 class from high school, uh, this is a parabola, right? upward pointing parabola. Um, but what does that have to do with the original question? Well, I can see what, happen what uh, this has to do with the original question by thinking about, well, what does this, setting y equal to c, what does that look like geometrically? Well, um, it's a plane. Right? y equals c is the equation of a plane. In fact, it's a plane that's perpendicular to the y-axis, uh, intersecting the y-axis at c. So what we have then is algebraically plugging in y equals c is equivalent to geometrically taking the cross-section. You know, again, if you have some thing you're looking at, if you set y equal to c, then you're looking at this vertical cross-section perpendicular to the y-axis. Um, uh, of the object that you're, uh, that you're actually interested in. So we're looking for a thing, whatever that is, when you take its cross-section perpendicular to the y-axis, the resulting cross-section has that equation. And so uh, keep in mind that this is an easy equation, old algebra 2 fact, parabola pointing upward. Um, I can actually, I've deduced a lot of information here already. And here's, in fact, what I can deduce. Um, for any particular value of c, the 
if I set y equal to c, and notice that this is the plane y equals c, right, then the result is this parabola z equals x squared plus c squared, where specifically the c squared is how far that parabola is up above the y-axis. Everybody on board? And so if you think about, okay, well, what are these, notice I've drawn a bunch of these different cross sections here, and that's because for different points on the y-axis, for different values of c, in other words, for different values of c, the parabola is pushed up by different amounts. Whatever c is, c squared is how much that parabola is pushed up. So uh, you get these uh, various different parabolas. Uh, when c is large, let me go back to that. Uh, when c is large, it's pushed up by quite a bit. When c gets smaller, in other words, as I move sort of more back toward the origin, eventually it's not pushed up at all. And then as c goes negative, c squared starts to get big again, and it's pushed up. So I get a bunch of parabolas pushed up by these uh, c squared amounts. Now, it's not really a perfect picture of my solution set. I still am not 100% clear on exactly what this looks like, but uh, you start to get a kind of a sort of a picture. You can kind of, a little sort of puzzle piece, fit these parabolas together and in your mind. Maybe persuade yourself that maybe this looks kind of like a bowl. Everybody kind of see a bowl being formed here? Okay, you can do these cross sections in different directions. So instead, for example, here's if I let x equal to c, I get that equation. These are also parabolas, but these are parabolas where z is a function of y. These are in the planes perpendicular to the x-axis. So I get this picture. There's still these various parabolas pushed up from the x-axis, but they're in planes perpendicular to the x-axis. Okay. So again, this kind of suggestive of a bowl. This one's kind of harder to draw somehow. It's just it's, they're in front of each other more so. It's a little bit weirder artistically. Um, one last picture you can draw. Um, you could set z equal to constants, giving you these equations. Uh, note these, we're looking at cross sections in horizontal planes, and in those horizontal planes we get, uh, well, those aren't parabolas anymore, but they're circles. Well, probably circles, but that is if C is positive. What if C is negative? C is negative, swing and a miss, right? There's nothing there. X squared plus Y squared under no circumstances can it be negative. So you get circles when C is positive nothing when c is negative, and if c is zero, you get just the origin. So you get this. So circles when c is positive, nothing when c is negative, and just the origin when z is zero. Okay, so now all together, if you look at these three pictures, yeah, you really do get a pretty decent idea of what this surface looks like, and it's a bowl. Right on board? Okay. Um, one more example. And then I'll let you read some of these others. Uh, let's look at this one here, z equals x squared minus y squared. Um, take the cross sections in various different directions. Um, if you set x equal to constants, then you get, that's a constant, and notice you have a downward facing parabola, right? But if you set y equal to constants, various different constants, you get an upward facing parabola. So depending on which way you're taking your cross sections, you either get upward parabolas or downward parabolas uh, in these different directions. By the way, side note, note that the upward parabolas are shifted down. 
goes to the minus sign. Notice that if, we, if there's our constants, the downward parabolas are shifted up because of the positive sign there. And if you fit those together, it kind of motivates something like this, what I like to call a Pringle. They used to call these saddles because uh, the Pringles didn't used to exist. Um, right, uh, another example I'm going to let you all read on your own. Um, okay, now here's a different way that you can make sense out of what various surfaces look like. Uh, I'm going to start with the observation that uh, whatever equation uh, you might happen to be looking at, you can always write it in this form if it's an equation of three variables. And very quickly, here's why. An equation usually certainly could look like this, you know, a bunch of stuff involving x, y, and z equals a bunch of other stuff involving x, y, and z. And the idea is you can always, just whatever's on the right, you can just move it over to the left of the minus sign, and now you've got stuff equals zero, right? But it just ends up being kind of convenient uh, to be able to describe equations. Uh, instead of having stuff on the left and stuff on the right, let's just imagine all the stuff on the left equals zero. Okay. All right. So, what I want to ask now is what happens if I have an equation, and suppose I know what the solution set to that equation looks like, maybe we've done cross sections, maybe it's something we've seen before and we already happen to know. Who knows what we already know what this surface looks like. What happens if I were to go through that equation and everywhere I see an x, I scratch that out and replace it with x plus 1. So what would that do to the solution set? Okay. Well, here's the idea. Um, so you can see what this would look like. Um, here's our original equation. Uh, if I do this, if I replace x with x plus 1, like so, right? notice that everywhere there had been an x, I've scratched it off and replaced it with x plus 1. And everything else stays the same. The y's don't change, the z's don't change, the, the what I'm doing to these things, the f doesn't change. x is getting replaced with x plus 1. So question, what can I say about the solutions to that new equation? And there's a pretty simple argument you can make here. Uh, the notation is um, really kind of the biggest impediment. I just would like to point out that the solutions here the x, y, z that make this new equation work. I double hitting that, sorry. x, y, z that make this equation work are points such that when I add 1 to the x coordinate, the resulting point. satisfies the old equation. All right, so let's just, again, just looking at what's written down. Um, the x, y, z that will work in the new equation are points such that when you add 1 to x, the resulting new point works in the old equation. And I've got that represented geometrically by this picture here. Um, the, uh, the original uh, equation that we were interested in, uh, f of x comma y comma z equals zero. The surface that I'm looking for is a surface such that when I add one to the x coordinate, I get a point that satisfies the old equation. Namely, I get a point that's on the old solution set. And another way of saying this, another way of saying that, uh, the thing that I'm looking for, if you shift it in the direction of the x-axis, gives you the old surface. Another way to say that is, if you take the old surface and shift it backwards in the x-direction, you get the new surface. That make sense? So in some sense, uh, when you do this process, when you um, take an equation, whatever the equation might happen to be, and if you rep all, you know, go through and replace 
x with x plus 1. The result on the solution set is that the solution set simply moves by negative 1 in the x direction. The solution set in some sense kind of has to undo what you're doing to the x variable because you have to undo it so that when you then do it, the result will be the same. I don't know if that grammatically makes sense. Everybody happy with that? Okay. So said differently, the result on the solution set is always kind of opposite of what you're doing to the equation. Um, so let's look at this example. Uh, so, um, right, there's an equation. x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 1. By the way, I know what that looks like. Right? x squared plus y squared plus z squared. That's the square of the distance from the origin. So this surface is the collection of points whose distance to the origin is equal to 1. That's a sphere. It's a sphere centered at the origin. Okay. That being said, what if I were to go through and replace every x with x plus 1? Well, by the analysis that we just gave, replacing x with x plus 1, this new set, this, excuse me, this new equation, its solution set should look a lot like the old one, just shifted by negative 1 in the x direction. Right, so our, we had a sphere centered at the origin. By doing this process, that process shifts this, the sphere over uh, giving me now, uh, again, a sphere, but just now centered at negative 1 on the x-axis instead of at 0 on the x-axis. Again, replacing x with x plus 1 causes you to shift in the minus direction. Is everybody following the example there? Now, let me just do a sanity check. I'm going to um, pose that I can actually argue that this analysis is giving me the right answer because I could look back at this example. Where are we? Yeah. Right. And notice that this left hand side of the equation is the distance squared between those two points. Right? This is, again, a Pythagorean little calculation, and it's the distance between x, y, z, and negative 1, 0, 0. So independently, I can argue that this is a sphere centered at negative 1, 0, 0. So this shifting argument is kind of confirmed in this case. Good? All right, so the idea then is that uh, this kind of thing works in lots of different uh, instances, uh, and uh, this is sort of a geometric representation of these various different examples. Um, so we argued here that if you replace x with x plus c, then that will shift, or what we call translate, your solution set by negative c. So adding c shifts by minus c. Okay. And then likewise, I hope it's not a stretch to suggest that if you add c to y, if you replace y with y plus c, then you will shift by minus c in the y direction. Same idea. You're having to undo what the algebra did, et cetera, et cetera. Let me shift down here. Uh, what if you replace z with uh, some scalar c times z. So in other words, said definitely, what if I multiply z by c in the equation? Or by z with cz. Well, the solution set is going to, in some sense, have the opposite done to it, something that would undo what this does. And in other words, it's going to be, uh, you could say, stretched by 1 over c. Or as I like to say it, it gets squished by a factor of c. Does that make sense? Just kind of undoing what you did with the algebra in order to make the equation still work. Um, now, conveniently, um, replacing something with the negative of itself, uh, the way you undo a multiplication by negative 1 is a multiplication by negative 1. Right? So this is a process that is kind of its own reverse. And so replacing y with negative y is a uh, reflection 
where y turns into negative y, or said differently, it's a reflection through the xz plane. It's a reflection, you might say, in the direction of the y-axis, and usually we talk about the plane that it reflects through would be the xz plane. Okay, so all of these um, results follow from uh, analogous uh, arguments. And uh, you might want to, by the way, maybe you know, pick one and try to reproduce the argument like we did for, for um, uh, translation uh, for some of these others. Okay. So, um, yeah. Okay, so we already did this one. Um, uh, one difference in the, this, uh, this example here, uh, you'll notice here I didn't tell you what the starting surface was. Uh, in the previous instance that we did this example, um, I said, uh, let's start with that surface and then from that try to decide what happens to this surface. So these were both given and then you just have to say, hey, what's the difference between these? Oh, the only difference is x got replaced by x plus 1. Um, in this case, I'm just giving you an equation and saying, hey, figure it out. Now you decide what you want to relate this to, if anything. Right. And so you can decide for yourself that, hey, you know, that actually looks kind of sort of like that. It's just that the x has been replaced by x plus 1. And then you can make this argument about, you know, well, this was a sphere, and therefore this is a translated sphere translated by minus 1. All right. So keep in mind, usually this is how these sorts of questions will come up. Usually, when you encounter an equation, it does not come attached with a, by the way, here's the easier surface that you should try to relate it to. Okay. okay. All right, I'm going to show you a weirder example now. Let's look at that one. Let's try to figure out what this solution set looks like. So we have to decide for ourselves uh, what more familiar surface does this kind of sort of look like in the equation? And then furthermore, how can I then relate, how can I sort of, if possibly in multiple steps, relate the known surface to the new unknown surface that I'm looking for? And the idea I'd like to argue is that that equation looks kind of like um, this equation. Not that different. So in fact, let me just come up and look at the picture here. Um, and in fact, let me scratch out these pictures because we don't know what the, these look like yet. And we haven't decided on what to do there yet. And what's going to happen here yet? This is all currently undecided. Okay, so here's my starting point. Um, this is an equation for which I know the surface. Here's the equation I'm given for which I would like to decide what the surface looks like. And we want to now sort of fill in the blanks and figure out what's the process by which I can turn this equation into that equation. And then as a result, keeping track of what that pro algebraic process was, what then in parallel happens to the solution sets. So I'm going to do this one step at a time. The first thing I'm going to suggest is that we do what we have to do to turn that equation into this equation. And you see that starts to make this look a little bit more like that. At least it makes that minus 1 show up. Okay. All right. Now the way I get that to happen, you'll notice, is I replace all the y's with my y minus 1's. Okay. Equation y, right? The whole equation, everywhere I see a y, I replace it with y minus 1. Now, having done so, I can deduce what this new surface looks like. This new surface up here is what I get when the center shifts over to the right by 1. Now, specifically, I subtracted 1 from y in the equation and therefore, I add one to the y on the picture. Right? It's that opposite sort of action. OK, so is everybody on board so far? All right, next question. Now what do I do? Um, what do I do 
to turn that equation into that equation. And what, what, what I need to do in order to do that is everywhere over here I see a y, I've got to replace it with 2y. Okay. Now notice it's just the y. The, the minus 1 is not like attached or something. I don't view it as, oh, what used to be y, which is in fact y minus 1, that's the whole thing. No, it's just the y itself. Forget about the old equation. We have here an equation and a, and a solution set. I don't need that anymore. So this y, replace it with 2y, and that turns the equation into what I want. Okay. Now, what happens in that process? Uh, what happens when you replace y with 2y? Geometrically, that is what happens. Well, um, the rule is that what happens is it sort of undoes this algebraic process of multiplying y by 2 suggested by this algebraic replacement, to the solution set, all of the y coordinates are going to be divided by 2. So there's a um, kind of a squishing by a factor of 2 in the y direction. This thing here, it gets squished. All the y coordinates get divided by 2, and therefore it squishes toward the xz plane. Everybody see that? Note, it does not squish toward the center of the sphere. Where the center of the sphere is, has got nothing to do with this algebraic replacement. Right? The center squishes right along with everything else. Everything gets, all the y-coordinates get divided by 2. That y-coordinate is 1. So therefore, after squishing, that y-coordinate there is half. The left side of this sphere had y equals 0. When it squishes, well, 0 divided by 2 is still 0. So that left sort of uh, point doesn't move. Everybody happy? So what we've got then is it was a two-step process. I couldn't sort of directly argue how I get from here to there because it's just uh, there isn't a single step that will do it, but I can combine steps. Uh, I do want to point out that the, the, uh, the order of these steps is critical. You've got to make sure to get the order right. Um, if you try to do it the other way, if you were to replace y with 2y first, and then replace y with y minus 1, uh, you're going to end up with 2y minus 2, which is not what we're interested in. Right. So you've got to be very careful. Think about the order that you do these things. It ends up being kind of the opposite of the order that you would, it's sort of the opposite of the typical order of operations. Because you're undoing things, right? in some sense you're going backwards. So you end up going backwards through the order of operations. So be very careful with the order. Think it through if you, um, be a good exercise for you all to do on your own. Try, see what happens if you do that replacement first, that replacement second, and persuade yourself that this doesn't work out right. Okay. okay. All right. Um, next trick. Um, rotations. This is a really powerful trick. A lot of multivariable calculus books don't talk about this. I think it's a huge mistake. This is really, really useful. Um, lots of surfaces that you end up wanting to look at have the feature that they are rotations of simpler things. And so um, here's the coincidence algebraic that you want to look out for. Sometimes your equation will have the property that x and y show up only as part of that specific expression, square root of x squared plus y squared. So there's no lone x's. There's no extraneous y's. There's no e to the y in there anywhere. It, the x's and y's show up only as part of square root of x squared plus y squared. That's a very important little expression. Okay, we'll see why in a moment here. Okay. So for example, look at this equation here. x and y don't appear separately in any way. They appear only as part of x squared plus y squared, specifically square root of x squared plus y squared, squared in this case. All right. So um, the reason that matters is that this expression, square root of x squared plus y squared, is the distance to the z-axis. Right? That's geometrically natural. 
that square root is the distance to the z-axis. So said differently then, what this means is if this is the case, if your expression involves x's and y's only and relating to the square root of x squared plus y squared, what you're saying is that we can decide whether or not our point satisfies this equation simply by knowing the z-coordinate and the distance to the z-axis. I don't need to know x and y. I just need to know square root of x plus y squared. I just need to know the distance to the z-axis. So I claim that when this happens, uh, when you have a, um, an equation of this form, oops, circled the wrong thing. You have an equation of that form, the result has rotational symmetry around the z-axis. And that is a lot of information. That's a huge amount of information to know about the surface that you're interested in, that it is symmetric. It's rotationally symmetric around the z-axis. And here's a picture of why. Um, if your surface has the feature that simply knowing z and distance to the z-axis We'll decide whether the point is on the surface or not. Then let's think about you know, this point. Suppose that point's on the surface, which I can determine by knowing its z, by knowing its distance to the z-axis. Um, what can I conclude about this point? Well, it's got the same z. It's got the same distance to the z-axis. So in fact, this is also on the surface. In other words, anytime you have a point that's on the surface, as you rotate it around the z-axis, all of those points are on the surface. Because they have the same z and they have the same r. So very powerful fact. Um, algebraically, you look for that being the only way that x's and y's appear. Geometrically, rotational symmetry around the z-axis. Everybody happy? This is part one of the observation. Um, the part two is coming up next. Okay, so part two goes like this. Um, oh, I'm just going to do it from the picture. So here's our surface that's got this rotational symmetry. around the z-axis, um, I appeal to your geometric intuition. I can generate that entire surface by looking at the cross-section of the surface in this half plane. And rotating that cross-section around the z-axis. This is just a geometric appeal. If it really is rotationally symmetric, any cross-section and, and a half plane that's hinged on the z-axis, and it's like just like this. Any such cross section, once you rotate that cross section around, that will sweep out and generate the whole surface. That's just kind of uh, what rotational symmetry is. Think about it. Right? Okay. Um, so what? Why do we care? Well, the good news is that taking this cross section is uh, geometrically convenient because that cross-section is very simply described. Um, that particular, the one I've drawn here anyway, that cross-section is described by y equals 0 and x greater than or equal to 0. Simple little algebraic thing to write down. And that's that half plane. Um, and it's a uh, Algebraically, a simpler thing. Note it's only a curve in the XZ plane. It's not a surface. It's not one of these three-dimensional, I don't know what this is, objects. It's a curve in the XZ plane. It's an algebra 2 problem. Okay. So what we have then is when you have one of these rotational things, when X and Y show up only in that form, you can cite rotational symmetry. Set y equal to 0 and x greater than or equal to 0, thus looking in this half plane, thus reducing your equation down to just a curve. And as soon as you know what that curve is, just rotate around the z-axis and declare victory. I'll show you an example. Um, 
Uh, now, uh, question, the quick question, uh, why is it that I looked in the half plane here? Uh, it, it would have been just as true to observe that, well, I could look in this entire plane going all the way over to the other side. Uh, certainly it's true that if I looked in the whole plane, I could still rotate, it would still generate the whole thing. There's just an annoyance that happens. If, if, you require, if you allow yourself to look in this whole plane, the algebra gets weird. It's hard to see this coming. It doesn't look like it would get weird. It looks very natural and simple to set y equal to zero. Um, let's see how that works out. Uh, here it is. Um, in your equation, there's your, how your x's and y's appear. If you set y equal to zero, that turns into square root of x squared, which is the absolute value of x. And that stinks. Right? Absolute values are awkward. Nobody wants to deal with absolute values. So looking in the entire plane where y equals zero leads to an algebraic headache. So let's add in the additional requirement. In addition to y equals zero, let's add the additional requirement that x is positive. That's the half plane. That was the you know where I drew the picture of initially. With y equals zero and x positive, namely in the half plane, absolute value of x actually is x because x is positive. So look at the half plane. Right? Require x to be positive. Get a much simpler algebraic result. It loses the absolute value. Super. OK. So uh, here's the final resulting theorem. Uh, we'll do an example momentarily. So if you have a surface where x and y appear only in the special form, that surface is what you get when you look in the xz plane, specifically the part where x is positive, and you rotate it around the z-axis. So a three-dimensional equation, I can deduce what the solution set to that surface is by looking in a half-plane cross-section, thus giving me an equation of two variables, an algebra two problem, and it's just that when I'm done with that algebra two problem, I just have to rotate the result around the z-axis. So let's see an example. Um, so I'm going to look at, uh, here's an old familiar uh, equation. Uh, we did this with cross-sections originally, right? z equals x squared plus y squared, and we uh, took cross-sections like this, and cross-sections like that, and we had these parabolas that were in these parallel planes, they were shifted up by different amounts, and it's a pretty hard art problem and a, a geometric challenge to think about how do these pieces fit together. It's pretty hard, arguably. Try drawing those pictures, it's harder than it looks. Right? Let's see how this works with the rotation argument. First, notice that x and y appear only in the special form. Square root of x squared plus y squared, quantity squared in this case. Okay. Next, per the hint, um, let's let y equal zero and require x to be positive. So whoops. So I set y equal to zero, scratch that off. And look what the equation turns into. It's a simple parabola. Now we're only going to look at the part of that parabola where x is positive, sure ends up not met really mattering in this case. I don't need x to be positive because there's no issues with, I mean, x is squared, so who cares? Um, and point is, this is an easy little, little algebra two problem. What does this thing look like? Well, z equals x squared, parabola. Simple algebra two problem. It's this parabola, uh, whoops. This parabola here, we're looking in this half plane and there's the parabola z equals x squared. Again, note only the part where x is positive. Now I appeal to your geometric intuition. What happens when you take this parabola, this half of a parabola, 
And when you rotate that around the z-axis, well, it, it uh, generates that bowl. Done. We don't have to piece together a bunch of different parabolas, uh, different heights, and different planes. and It's just, oh yeah, the cross section's a parabola, rotate it, paraboloid. You might see the power in this argument. This is very, very handy. It'll save you loads of difficult artistic challenges and trying to visualize what things look like. Okay, here's a harder one. Uh, what does this thing look like? Okay. Same game. Uh, notice that x and y appear only in the special form. There's a square root of x squared plus y squared, and furthermore, there's no other x's. There's no other y's, there's no sign of y in here, nothing like that. That being said, that is rotationally symmetric around the z-axis. Let's look in the half plane. Um, so specifically, I'm going to set y equal to 0. Let x be positive. That's our typical half plane that we like to look at. Um, and look at what the equation becomes. The equation becomes, um, hmm, well, let's see here, absolute value of x. Oh, oh, wait, wait, x is positive, thankfully. So it becomes just x plus z squared minus 1 equals 0. Um, or perhaps more conveniently, uh, x equals 1 minus z squared. So, Upside down parabola. Now x is funny, okay, so it's a sideways parabola, but x is, uh, the parabola opens in the negative x direction because of that minus sign. Okay. Specifically, this looks like that. Right, x equals 1 minus z squared. Now, importantly, keep in mind, in order to be able to have this algebraic convenience, in order for square root of x squared to just be x, I had to insist that x is positive. You can't just throw that absolute value away uh, and then um, get rid of the condition that made that possible. You are now stuck with this condition. You're stuck with x greater than or equal to 0. So, in fact, I don't want to know what the whole parabola looks like. I want to know just the part where x is positive. So in other words, just that part of the parabola. All this stuff up here, I don't care. All that stuff down there, don't care. It's not relevant. Okay. So we have just um, that curve. Uh, rotate around the z-axis and you get this uh, sort of football looking shape. Uh, that we have there. Yeah? Uh, why are we negative y? What do you mean? To, oh, uh, because the whole point to this is I wanted to know what the cross section was in a, in this half plane, and that half plane is where y is equal to 0. One in the xz plane. I'm sorry? One in the xz plane? One in the xz plane? Yeah, we're, that's right. We're looking at the uh, inside of the xz plane. That's right. Now, specifically the x positive part inside of the xz plane, but still in the xz plane, and so y is still 0. Yeah. Absolutely, that's a great question. So um, it is entirely free. If you would say, if you would prefer to say, I don't like that half plane, I would rather look at this half plane, uh, where x is zero and y is greater than or equal to zero. It's totally fine. Absolutely. So the algebra would look a little bit different, right? But it's still a half plane. It still gives you a cross section. It would still have the feature that that cross section, when you rotate it around, gives you the same exact surface. Totally fine. There's an argument that says that this half plane is a little bit better, even, because uh, just artistically, there's sort of no perspective issues in trying to draw it. Yeah. When you're when you're drawing that one, isn't that where c is greater than or equal to zero, not where y is? In, in this one here? Yeah. Uh, no, z can be negative. But but where where you're drawing that, isn't that um, well, I, I, don't, I don't understand the question. I mean, this half plane, that this is intended to be part of the yz plane. This is where x is equal to 0, yeah. right? And note that z could be positive, z could be negative, but y is always positive. I'm, I'm ignoring where y is negative. Yeah. 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 Okay. So yeah, you can pick any half plane you want. If you just felt like being weird, 
you could look in that half plane where x is 0 and y is negative, or at least on positive. It's a little bit weird. I don't know why anyone would want to do that. Um, it introduces the algebraic inconvenience that then the absolute value of y is equal to negative y. It's, I mean, look, you can do that if you want, but I see no advantages to this. All right, so I'm going to suggest don't, don't play with it. No advantage. Okay. Oh. All right. Um, so there's several examples in here. I'm going to maybe do a, uh, one or two. We'll see how much time I have. Um, yeah. Eh. Let's see what we can do here. Um, yeah. Let's look at this example. Maybe I'll sketch these examples because I would kind of like to say something about both of them. Um, so there we go. Um, X and Y appear only in the magic form. This, before I know anything about what this thing looks like, I can suggest just from this that it's rotationally symmetric around the z-axis. So pick a half plane, do the cross section, rotate. Right? And in this case, what you get if you um, Look in the uh, the x z plane half plane. There's your equation. You get a parab uh, excuse me a hyperbola. So I hope everybody remembers their algebra two from way back when. You know, good time to brush up if it's been a while. Right, make sure you know what this all prerequisite for the course. So um, that's a hyperbola like this. And so you rotate that around, and that generates this picture. So this is what we call a hyperboloid. Uh, more specifically, this is called a hyperboloid of one sheet. Uh, it turns out that there is a different kind of a hyperboloid, we're going to see in a few seconds, of a hyperboloid of two sheets. Um, so one sheet because this is all one connected piece. This is all one single thing. Um, so on the other hand, let's look at this. Now it's so tricky a little bit, but in fact, x and y appear in this equation only as part of square root of x squared plus y squared. It's just that it's squared and then times minus 1. Nevertheless, you can write this in terms of square root of x squared plus y squared. So rotationally symmetric, half plane, cross section, hyperbola, algebra 2 reference, and it ends up being this hyperbola. The only thing is, don't forget, we're looking only at the part where x is positive. Not that it really matters in this case. There's the part where x is positive. And this, when you rotate it around the z-axis, um, notice that it uh, makes uh, two separate sheets, we call them. So there's, uh, I like to think of these as kind of like being two contact lenses that are you know, one like this and one kind of like that. Um, so this is also a hyperboloid because it's a rotation of a hyperbola. It's just that it's got two chunks. So this is the hyperboloid of two sheets. Not to be confused with a hyperboloid of one sheet. Okay. So there are some analogous results. Uh, if you're rotating around different axes, uh, I'm going to leave it to you guys to check, think through the, uh, the argument and confirm these results. Uh, specifically, if y squared plus z squared, square root of y squared plus z squared are the only ways that uh, y and z appear, well, this is the distance to the x-axis. You can make an argument about this being rotationally symmetric around the x-axis, and therefore what you get when you rotate around the x-axis, a particular cross-section. Right. Uh, similarly, if x and z appear only as part of square root of x squared plus z squared. That's rotationally symmetric about the y-axis, cross-sections, rotations, etc. So you have various different results uh, here. And um, uh, for example, this. Now it's tempting to look at this equation here and say, oh, oh, look at that. That's disappointing. I've got a positive x squared, but then a negative y squared. and that's just not part of x squared plus y squared, and I just can't do anything with this. Um, well, you can't around the z-axis, but now look at the x and the z. 
right? X squared plus Z squared is the only way that X's and Z's appear here. So this is rotationally symmetric around the Y axis. And if you go through the details, um, it's, uh, whoops, didn't draw that well. It's that thing. So this is another hyperboloid of one sheet, just on a different axis. Everybody happy? Okay, I've skipped several of the exercises. Strongly encourage you all to fill those in on your own. Um, we're out of time, uh, and that, uh, well, we're a little behind schedule. We'll catch up, we always do. Okay, see you all later.